Turn your Bibles over to Matthew 7. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew 7. I don't think so. <laughs> I was not going to call myself out, so. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hey, no, you're fine. I appreciate it. I thought I'd get away with it because I'm the one who has to announce it, so. And I figured maybe Pastor just skip over it, trust on my judgment, but apparently not. But um, uh, turn your Bibles over to Matthew 7. Uh, Matthew 7. If you'll... Uh, And we're there in uh, verse 13. And the title of this, uh, the message this morning is, There Are No Shortcuts. There Are No Shortcuts. And um, we're there in Matthew 7, 13. And the Bible says, Enter ye at the, in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then we were to continue reading. It just says there in verse 17, says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good, good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth Good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not uh, that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherebore, wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so we see here that uh, it's kind of a paradox, but we know that that term or that statement, there are no shortcuts, is a negative tape statement, right? But the very first thing I want to just point out before we get into the message is I am going to focus on the fact that, you know, the older you get, the, the more you realize there are no shortcuts. You know, I mean, when you're young, and you don't, you know, maybe listen to your parents or you're not very mature. You're always trying to find the easy way out. Sometimes in life, though, it doesn't matter how old you are. We just don't ever grow up and get around the fact that there are no shortcuts. I mean, that's why to this day, Ponzi schemes and get rich, get, uh, get rich quick schemes exist. And, you know, people just want to find the, the easy way out and you know the Bible even tells us that at the end in the end times what we're actually dealing with now and I believe we're getting closer to that time you know in Isaiah 30 it says that they, they're going to want to say hey look lie to us just speak smooth things to us you know just say nice things don't preach to us the word of God but before we do that just inherently and from the beginning shortcuts is not a, a negative thing you know, just a shortcut in itself, just the definition by it, doesn't always have to be a negative thing. As a matter of fact, we have a paradox here, right? The straightest, I mean, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And the, the, the easiest way to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. There's only one way, right? I mean, I guess in a way you could say the spiritual shortcut is through Jesus Christ because it's not of our works, but His works. You know, the fact that He did the completed work you know, the death, burial, and resurrection, the, the fact that He came to this earth, that He died for us, that it's by grace, uh, and it's all we have to do is believe. But the, the reality is that in life, most times, our nature is to find the path of least resistance. And the Bible completely 
uh, obliterates that and teaches us the opposite. The reality is the only way to learn anything is to, you know, to go through it. There are no shortcuts in whatever aspect of our lives we are. And so I'm going to go through just a couple of points today of what I mean by this, what the Bible teaches us, and it's going to be folks there in Matthew 7. You know, so just keep your finger there in the, in the book of Matthew. We're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Matthew. But just, an intro, just as a way of introduction, you know, just the, the term, like I said, the shortcut, just means a route more direct than one ordinarily taken. And what's interesting about that, if you were to take that and just apply it spiritually, you know, the paradox is people are always trying to find the easy way into heaven by thinking that it's their works that get them into heaven, when the only way to heaven is the simplest way is just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? I mean, I know it sounds very, very confusing, but that really is the way life is. People are like, look, if I do these things, and if I go here, and if I go to this church, or if I belong to this denomination, I'll get to church. They're thinking that's the shortcut, when in reality, the shortcut is through Jesus Christ. All right? I mean, uh, another definition is that it's a method of means of doing something more directly and quickly than and often and not so thoroughly as by ordinary pr pr uh, procedure. Uh, the last one, I'm not going to bring it up because it's just shortcut keys. You know, I mean, obviously, you have shortcuts on a, on a keyboard. But then you also have, you know, uh, this is the one that really stood out. It's the second definition. It's a transitive verb, and it's to circumvent. And that's what society is doing today. That's what the devil wants to convince you is that there's a, cir a way to circumvent, you know, the, the hard life. That there's a way to get the easy life. And, you know, I was talking about this uh, earlier this morning about how life is tough anyways. I mean, I think that one of the realities that, we, you know, if we could come to the reality quicker, sooner than later, we would avoid trying to get shortcuts in our life. You know, we would avoid trying to do things the easy way because there is no easy way. I mean, the reality is the more you live, the harder life gets. People, you know, just backstab you. There's, you know, you have problems. The older you get, you have more health problems. You have more health issues. Uh, you know, your family leaves you and abandons you. You have less friends. How many of you can say that you have a friend from like elementary or high school? You know, I mean, honestly, that, that doesn't even... As you get older, you end up moving into different stages of life. You think about it, you live different lives as you get older. And one of the things, though, that's true is that you can either repeat the same mistakes or actually start to walk the narrow, the, you know, the, narrow, the narrow way. And so I'm not talking to those today that are looking for salvation. Obviously, this message wouldn't even ring true because first you'd have to be in the spirit to understand what I'm even trying to say. I'm talking to those of you who are saved and you know, the things that we need to do in our spiritual life to be able to avoid the, 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 the draw, I guess, of a shortcut. Because it's easy. And we live in a nation that provides a lot of shortcuts. I mean, uh, just recently, I was talking to my wife yesterday, and um, a bunch of these feministas, I guess, got up and decided that they were going to uh, re, uh, rehash something called the Marshall Plan, this was after the World War where basically they want to give like $2,000 a month to mothers because they're working hard and the economy's hard. But, you know, it's always veiled in something. But they want to do it to working mothers because they basically what they're doing is creating, they want to create a, a government handout. Now, whether it's going to make it or not doesn't matter. But that's the kind of country we live in where we're always trying to give everybody the easy way out. You know, we're always bailing out the big corporations. We're always having a government handout. And by the way, I'm not against welfare in, in, in general. You know, the Bible has, wants us to minister to others, but there's a difference between helping someone along and carrying someone along. You know, I mean, that's a huge difference night and day. And so let me not get off on a tangent here, but, you know, the reality is that society has trained us to just rely on shortcuts. You know, another way we could look at it is to rely on a safety net. You know, we always think that someone's going to bail us out when the reality is we need to lean on the Word of God. We need to rely on Jesus Christ. We need to rely on His statutes, His doctrine to be able to, to, to suffer through or to weather through the storms of life. You know, like I said again, I just want to make it a shortcut isn't necessarily always negative. But most of the time when we think of 
a shortcut, it carries a negative connotation, right? Most of the time, it carries, you know, this, this negative thing because people are looking for the easy way out. Whether it's in business, whether it's in life, whether it's in marriage, whether it's with raising kids, you know, I mean, we just create all kinds of shortcuts. Uh, you know, uh, this country, before we had families, we had mothers who would stay at home and raise their children. Now we have a whole other industry that's probably worth millions and billions. It's called the daycare industry, where parents go and drop their kids off to be taken care of from the time that they're born. I mean, I remember growing up and the daycare industry was just like, you know, for the toddlers. And over time, it's just gotten to the point where like, you know, your kid's born, you've been out of the hospital for a week, six weeks, boom, throw them into the daycare system and get, you know, that kind of uh, brainwashing. That's a shortcut. The reality is nobody wants to put in the work that's required to raise a children. I mean, a child, right? Or your children in general. But let me, let me just get to the point here. The first shortcut, you're there in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, we're going to spend some time in the Gospels. We're also going to go to the Old Testament, but if you just want to keep your finger in the New Testament, you're not jumping around. But if you want to keep up with me, we're going to cover a lot of Scripture today. But Matthew 7, verse 21, and I get all my points from these things, is God, God's showing them. He says, look, narrow is the way. And in Matthew 7, 21, what does Jesus say? He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So the very first thing we got to get rid of is remove from our life this water, uh, this muddied, confusing gospel message. In other words, we don't want to even associate with people who give lip service to Jesus is the only way. And that's why we preach so hard against the false doctrines, the false religions that exist out there today. Because we don't want to be associated with anybody who would confuse the gospel. I mean, even longtime friendships. I mean, just recently I got an email from someone that I know that, you know, it was uh, through that influence that I got saved. And they were, they were focused a lot on the works. And almost to the point where, you know, they were saying stuff like, you know, uh, if you wear a mask or... If, you're, if you think the coronavirus is real and all this stuff, then maybe you're not saved. That's a big leap. Last I checked, salvation is by faith through grace. I mean, by grace through faith. I always get those backwards, but it's by grace through faith. Last time I checked, all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a group of Christians that are for the mask. There's a group of Christians that are not for the mask. There's a group of Christians that believe the coronavirus is real. There's a group of Christians that don't. I'm not here to argue the point. What I'm, what I'm arguing the point is, if those group of Christians believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? We're all going to be in heaven together. And we're all going to figure out who was right on what. And maybe, I don't know if there will be a contest or not. But you, it's not going to matter at the end of the day. What matters is that spiritual battle. What matters is having a clear gospel message. Every week, hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses go out and knock doors. Every week, the Mormons send out all their young missionaries to pervert the gospel message, and they preach Jesus. They preach Jesus Christ. I mean, as a matter of fact, the Mormons changed their name. It's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's not even, and it's not even the same Jesus. So we cannot get a shortcut through that. And every, every day, Christianity grows more ecumenical. It wants to be more inclusive. It wants to be more accommodating. It wants to be more tolerant. It wants to be more, you know, accepting of everybody. And the reality is, as that continues, we have to be more separate. The Bible says to sanctify ourselves. That means to separate ourselves from that. If you go there to John 6, 32, the Bible actually clears up what the will of, of God is. Because, you know, one of the things we, we, we struggle with when we go so in is people say, well, doesn't the Bible say that we need to do the will of the Father? Yeah, but... That's the spiritual application, right? You can't even begin to walk in the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit in you. John 6, 32, the Bible says, Then Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And we know that the Bible also refers to Jesus as the word, right? Thy word is, thy word is truth. And then verse 34 says, then, say, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh up to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye shall also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at that last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus came to fulfill the Father's will, and his will is to, in order for us to fulfill the Father's will, is first to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. People want to argue, you know, you got to do the Father's will. Well, first of all, do you even know the Father? Jesus says, look, if you don't know me, you don't know the Father. You know, Muslims pray to God. The Hindus pray to a God. I mean, the atheists, when they're in trouble, will pray to a God. They're not praying to God the Father unless you have Jesus Christ. And, and too much today, we see it often and we see it consistently and it's growing worse, is this muddying down of the gospel message. You know, and it's veiled and sometimes it sounds really good, but you really do got to scratch that surface and you got to get deeper because we want to be separate. We want to give a clear God. I don't want to leave somebody. Sorry to interrupt my own. My, my wife hates that I, I, I interrupt my own thoughts and I just caught myself. But, you know, I don't want to leave somebody with a false sense of security that they think they're saved because of something that I said wrong. I'd rather be clear and they know that they're facing hell and that's in the back of their mind than the opposite. You know, for many years, I thought I was saved. I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. You know, I didn't go to church. I mean, I went to church on Saturday. I try to not eat meat, although that's really hard. You know, I try to not eat shrimp. I try to, you know, fast every Saturday and all that. That doesn't get you anywhere. I was headed on a road to hell. And today, there's millions and billions of people headed on a road to hell because of that. Deuteronomy 8, you don't have to turn there. Turn to Matthew 4. Turn to Matthew 4. The Bible says that Jesus is the bread, right? He's talking, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Deuteron Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. If we go back to the very beginning to the first five books of the Bible, we see this, this, uh, this doctrine, we see this truth being told to us. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, that man doth not live by bread alone only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And we're going to see that in Matthew 4, whose quote, Jesus quotes this verse, when he's getting tempted by Satan. What's interesting is, what did, what did God do? What does he remind him? He says, look, I didn't let you take a shortcut. I made you suffer, I made you hunger, so that you knew where you relies, where, what you relied on, which is Jesus Christ, which is the Word of God, which is me, the rock, that foundation. But too often, we try to find the easy way out. You know, I'm not, if you do that, I just encourage you that you would do less of daily devotionals and a little bit more of reading the Bible. I am not against if you want to read something the complements the Bible, but the majority of your reading spiritually should be the Bible. You should spend the majority of your time when you say, hey, I need some spiritual healing in my life. I need some motivation. I need some truth. Don't pick up a daily devotional or don't pick up, you know, a commentary. Pick up the Bible. Now, if you want to compliment it, I mean, you, each of you has to answer to God for how you lead your life. But the reality is you can just get it all from the Word of God. You know, that's why I'm very careful because this, the Bible didn't say the bread of life and, you know, some 
you need to, to dip it in something. It just says it's the bread of life. As a matter of fact, when Jesus gave him the manna, there was nothing to dip it in because it was so good, it didn't need anything to be added to it. You know, it fed the flock. It's a picture of what we need to do now today is feed ourselves with that sweet word of God. But go to Matthew 4, verse 3, and it says, And when the tempter came to him, you know, this is speaking of Satan tempting Jesus, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We stand on the King James Word. We stand on the King James Bible because it is the Word of God. We don't listen to perversions. We don't listen to the non-inspired version. We don't read all this junk that's just promoting sodomy and promoting evolution and promoting confusion and promoting all kinds of, you know, just erroneous ideas. I mean, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. But where does it start? It starts with the foundation, right? I mean, you ever met a Mormon? Some of these Mormons might live better lives than you do. I, mean, I don't drink caffeine. Hey, I'm a, I love coffee. That's the first thing I drink in the morning. And some people don't drink coffee. That's great for you. You know, I got into the bad habit. I like a good, dark cup of coffee. I put a little bit of honey. You know, that gets my morning going. I think I drink coffee just for the flavor. I've got so much energy. I don't know that I necessarily need coffee, but I just like the coffee. Mormons don't even drink coffee. They don't drink alcohol. They are polygamists, though. So it's kind of interesting, that, you know, the way they balance stuff out. But what I'm trying to say is it's not the works, right? But they think that they're going to get to the Lord and say, didn't we do all these great things in your name? They gave lip service to Jesus Christ. And they're damning people to hell. Now, the second thing we want to look at there, go back there to Matthew 7 and verse 22. You don't want to trust in the wrong work. And what I mean by that is salvation, we know that's a free gift. And like I said, that's going to be the theme for the rest of my life. It's just to make sure we, we, we're always clear on the gospel message. But that doesn't negate the fact that after you're saved, look, after you're saved, you still go work, right? I mean, you still have a job in the world. You're still feeding your family. Why wouldn't you work for the Lord? That doesn't negate the fact that, you know, it's our reasonable service to serve the Lord. We should be willing to want to work for the Lord because it's the greatest message and it's the greatest gift that we can offer anybody. It's the gift of Jesus Christ. And Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. You know, I, I, the very first times I, I read this, I didn't understand it until you realize, you know, it's probably I didn't understand because I wasn't saved, but what are these individuals all focused on? Me. Poor little old me. What, what, it, what is the, the world, whether it's the coronavirus or it's social media or it's Hollywood or whatever, what is it all focused on? Me. It's ego, right? It's your safety. It's your 15 minutes of fame. It's your comfort. It's your money. It's your country. It doesn't matter what side you stand on, right? I mean, why did why was Trump so popular? Make America great again. We weren't worried about other people. We were worried about me, right? Why do the Democrats vote for Biden? Because they're worried about me. I want to get that stimulus package. I want to get that check. I want to get that, well, you know, I want to be on that government dole. It's all about me. Why does social media, it, why is it so prevalent in the world today? It's all about me. The selfies and the Twitter posts and I don't know what, I mean, there's a bunch. I'm so, I actually, you know you're getting older because I, I don't know what the younger guys, but I think it's TikTok and Snapchat and, and Twitch. And then if I'm after that, I don't know. You know, I, 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 I try to keep up, but it's hard. But you're, you're there. Um, and actually, I'm going to read for you numbers. But go to, go to Matthew 17, because I said we're going to be there in Matthew a lot. But go to Numbers 11 if you want to. 11, I'm in verse 24, and it says, and, when, and Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacles. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took the spirit that was upon him, and gave it to, unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass 
when the Spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied and did not cease. They preached because the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And it didn't cease. But pay attention, it says, But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, and one of the young men answered and said, My Lord, Moses forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God not, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit on them? And Moses get in him, get him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And we don't have time to go into the story, but for the most part, if you're there, it's, it's a very negative part, but we see this positive thing. And even then, what does Moses say? Are you envying these people? And what's going on is they're focused, what, again, on the wrong work. They're focused on the wrong thing. Today, we have churches, we have pastors, we have congregations outside of this that envy other congregations. And they're not willing to stand with other men of God. And they're not willing to fight in the spiritual battle. And look, if you're not willing to fight in the spiritual battle, that's fine. But sometimes they get in the opposition of it. You know, just, I mean, uh, shut up. Don't say anything. But no, everybody has an opinion. And we, we get too nice. We're, you know, the society today, they, they focus on the wrong work. They just want to, because they want to focus on their works. We have Christi Christian groups. We have pastors and, and Christian, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, even, even Baptist names like the Southern Baptist Convention that want to go out there and have a whole ministry for queers. And they want to bring them in. And they want to be nicer than Jesus. And, they, and then they want to bring in, you know, the, uh, the adulterers and the fornicators and tell them, hey, stay, be who you are as long as you come. That's not, that's not the work that God wants us to focus on. So what, was Mo, what did Moses focus on? He says, would it be that everybody had the spirit to prophesy? You know, I think that we're bothered a little bit because they're telling the truth. They're preaching God's word and it pricks a little bit. Look, if you were, if you were to actually read your Bible every day, you'd run into pages in the Bible that might rub you a little, wrong a little bit. Now, I use this example all the time because maybe that's something I got to work on myself. But when the Bible says love your enemies, that's a very hard thing to do when you're getting backstabbed left and right. But the Bible says love your enemies, period. So if you have enemies today, love them. You know what the Bible also says? To forgive. The Bible also says there's a time to love and there's a time to hate. So... Are we going to follow the right works or are we going to follow the wrong works? Matthew 17, 14 says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, leaning down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out by prayer and fasting. Look, just because you're saved, doesn't mean you're growing in faith. The Bible doesn't require, it didn't say this much faith to get saved. It just says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the gospel. It doesn't give you this measurement that says, oh, but your faith is not from here to here. You're not saved. It's just all you have to do is believe. But to walk in faith, we've got to apply some things. Even the, even the, the, the apostles, the disciples, they're like, hey, we couldn't get this done. Why? Why do you say? Because of your unbelief. You know, because sometimes we read the Bible and we know that God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
But then we get up in the morning and we have anxiety because, you know, we don't know how we're going to cover next month. Or we don't know, uh, or, or we don't want to preach the right gospel message, or we might not want to stand behind a man of God because we don't know what kind of uh, backlash that's going to come at us. Look, the Bible says he's got us, then he's got us. And the, and the battle's coming, it's getting worse. It's already worse for some others. It may, not, it may not come to us directly, but it's there. We better be ready to stand and fight. You know, Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, 47, we're focused on the right type of work. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast out into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them out into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What was the first thing that they focused on? I thought it was, you know, when I started doing the study, they said, did we not cast out? Have we not cast out devils? You know who's going to cast out the devils? Jesus. He's telling them right there, you didn't pray and fast. You were trying to do it on your own volition. We want to get into the battle. And just like in the Old Testament, you have all these examples of people that come to God and they're like, hey, should we go fight? God says, don't go fight. We're going to go fight. Hey, we lost. Well, I told you not to fight. Yeah, we got to get into the right frame of mind. They're, they're, God's the one casting them out into eternal damnation. Look, I don't know who, of all the people that we've led to Christ or that, per, that told us that they believe, I don't know how many believe. Our job is to cast out the net. Those that believe, they're going to heaven. Those that aren't, they're going to be cast out. Psalm 40, and you don't have to turn there uh, for the sake of time. Uh, you guys, Turn over to Deuteronomy 32, but Psalm 40, I'm going to read a couple of Psalms. Let me tell you what kind of work we need to focus on. The Bible says in Psalm 40, verse 1, it says, The chief musician, a Psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And he brought me also... Uh, uh, and he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. This is a picture of salvation. We're on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. And it says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such a turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are... Thy wonderful works, which thou hast done, and thy thoughts, which are, uh, which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. I, if I would declare and speak of them, they are, mo they are more that can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, Thy law is within my heart. He's focusing on whose works? God's wonderful works. And this is a picture of salvation. What work was done for us to be saved? The work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Not, we, we don't have to work for salvation. It's free. Stop telling people the wrong message. And I'm not, I don't know, I'm not saying you're, you're saying it, but if you are, fix it. And if you hear of somebody saying the wrong message, fix them, you know, rebuke them. And then... Help, let's focus on the right type of work. It says in Psalm 78, 1, you don't have to turn there, like I said, for the sake of time. It says, uh, Mask Hill of Asaph, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord in His strength, in his wonderful works that he had done. Look, how do we get the next generation? We focus them on Christ. Too many times we got all these false preachers and these congregations and these uh, you know, church members that are just posting about how great they are at you know, going to church and how great they are at reading their Bible. And you know, like, I'm not against every once in a while just praising someone and 
You know, it's a good thing that people are out soul winning. But if you're doing it all the time, you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons. Let's teach our children where the wonderful works come from. It's not because of anything great I did. You know, the house that I have is not because I'm that good at what I do. It's because God provided it for us. The congregation we have is not because, you know, I was such a great uh, associate pastor that, you know, all of a sudden you guys wanted to show up. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I'm that great of a preacher. But you show up because it's God's work. God gives the increase. It has nothing to do with who, who's behind the pulpit. Psalm 107 verse 8 says, Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as, it's, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands asunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And if you thought I did that three times on purpose, that's actually the verses. God's making a point. People are in distress, they're scared, they're in darkness, they're in chain, we're, we're slaves to our government and to our money and to our media and everything. Hey, let's get back to the Lord and praise His works and His goodness and He'll break those bands asunder. You want freedom today? Focus on the Word of God. Focus on the work of God. And then the final thing, when we're closing out in Matthew 7.23, it says, And then... And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. The Lord doesn't even know them. That's harsher than saying, you know, I knew you, but I don't want to associate with you. That's how we should live our lives. I want to rebuke the evil that's out there, but I don't even want to know them. I don't want to have any association with them. Maybe that's why God's making some changes in my life. He's just helping me separate from all that. It's a wicked world. And we better keep a, our wits about us. The only way to do that is know that there are no shortcuts. Let me, let me start closing this out. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 1, the Bible says, Give ear, give ear O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine... What we believe on shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right he is. That's why you can't be around iniquity. And we shouldn't associate with that. But not only that, if we're standing on the rock, then we need to stand on that rock. It doesn't say hide behind the rock. It says stand on the rock. Psalm, 14, uh, Psalm 141, 4 says, Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. Look, we have to guard our heart with the word of God because we can get sympathetic. Do you know that psychopaths are really good at mimicking other people? And so they're really good at getting sympathy from people and empathy. If we're not careful, we could fall into the trap where we feel like we need to give them a chance. We have a society that's like, well, and poor little Timmy, I mean, I know he's a, a serial thief that's headed down a bad path, but, you know, let's help him out. You know, there's a difference between you catch it when, you know, you, you nip it in the bud, as they would say, and now it's become like a, a pattern, a way of life. 
You need to break that pattern, but you need to break that with truth. You need to admonish that. You need to discipline that. You know, you can't, you, you can't fix somebody when they're in their 20s if you didn't address it when they were in, you know, young children. Or vice versa. You know, uh, Micah 2.1 says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in their power, it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Look, the Bible is clear. He says that turn, he never knew them because they worked iniquity, right? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. We need to pay attention to the fact that people are wicked. The world is wicked. That they go to bed at night and they're just thinking how to mess somebody up. You don't think that's real? Just ask somebody who got divorced, was in a bad divorce. Or, I mean, just look at yourself. I mean, you, you probably had to hold yourself. If you're following God, you've hold, had to hold yourself back from wanting to get back at someone. It's a dangerous world we live in. We've got to realize that it's an evil world and that it needs saving. But in order to save people... We give them the gospel and we preach the truth of Jesus Christ. We don't sympathize and we don't get along to go along. I don't care if, if it doesn't sound like the, you know, the dogmatic doctrine that the world's spewing out today. You know, the world would have you think that we came from nothing. T turn to Matthew 7, 24, because that's, that's the last verse we're closing out. But the world would have you think that we come from nothing. You know, they, they're constantly pushing evolution. And when we, when we speak that we believe the world was made in six days, that's us sanctifying ourselves. And you got these guys, and they sell you these, these idiots like Bill Nye, the science guy, and he comes out in a lab coat, and he gives you science experiments and makes it all nice, and he lures you in because he sounds cool and he sounds nice, and your kids fall for it. He's devising ways in his head to work iniquity. I mean, you you know we I grew up watching Saturday night you know Saturday not Saturday Saturday morning cartoons you know after these messages we'll be right back I mean I, I know them because right around eight o'clock we'd wake up turn on the TV and we'd watch all the morning cartoons and one of the things that we, that we watched in between the cartoons was Pee Wee Herman's Funhouse guys Pee Wee Herman is a blown out sodomite who later on in his life was in a wicked place with a bunch of other men and exposed himself and got in trouble for doing that kind of stuff. I don't have to go into details. This is the kind of people that were indoctrinating me and my generation. This is who babysat us when our parents weren't willing to sit down with us. And then we wonder why a bunch of people my age are confused about what they believe and who they think they are. They can't make up their mind whether they're a man or a woman. I mean, this is, the, this, this is what we saw. And then we wonder why men can't act like men and women can't act like women. Thank God that my dad was the way he was with us and that he wouldn't let us act effeminate or that he wouldn't let us, you know, uh, think that way. I remember one time, you know, I, I think I've told this before. I remember one time my brother wanted to get an earring because back in the early 90s, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a, a rap artist. He was a white guy by the name of Vanilla Ice. And, you know, everybody wanted to be cool like him. And he had an earring on his left ear because that made, meant that you were... <laughs> think about the stupidity of the world. If you had an earring on your left ear, you were a man, right? And you liked women. But if you had an earring on your right ear then you, like, you were a man who liked other men. First of all, the only time anybody should be wearing the earrings is women, and that's even if you want them to wear jewelry. But, so anyways, my, my brother comes to my dad, and, and I remember how I got a little envious because my brother came to my dad initially, and he's like, Dad, I want to get an earring. And my dad said yes. And so I got, I'm mad. I'm like, man, I should have asked, you know, because I thought it was cool too. And so, you know, we're playing this thing out, and my, dad, my brother's kind of excited, and my dad goes, okay, well, let's go to the mall. Here's how it's going to go. He goes, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into the 
girls section of the store. We're going to have you pick out a dress. And we're going to have you pick out some high heels. And once you come out dressed like a girl, then we'll get you near me. Of course, my brother was you know, it was great. I mean, I, if my brother, if my son ever comes, that's probably how. But think about it. I'm glad that he did that. But why did my brother want an earring? It's not, I mean, my brother's happily married. He, he doesn't. Because of the influence of society. Because that was cool. Because somebody says they devised iniquity and they worked evil upon their bed. Somebody went to bed at night thinking, how can we brainwash the youth of America? And they were like, we just got to make it cool. We got to make it, it, you know, nice. And then what did they do? They came up with all these stupid things that make no sense at all. Men are men and women are women, period. Now let's go ahead and close out. So we've got to realize, going back to the title of the message, there are no shortcuts. Look, how do we fight the battles? We've got to put on the whole armor of God. How do we avoid being brainwashed? We've got to sanctify ourselves in the Lord, right? And we've got to not give lip service to just, just for the sake of being cool. Look, I'd rather you not tell me anything and disagree with me than you tell me that you agree with stuff just so that it sounds cool. You know, the Bible actually calls that flattery, and it's actually a very negative thing. God doesn't want to hear how great you are and how many people. You're, he just wants to know that you're willing to do the work, do it in secret, and what, is, what does God say? He's going to reward thee openly, right? But let's go to Matthew 7, 24. It says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was that the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. At his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Look, if we preach the truth of God, people are going to be astonished and they're going to figure stuff out. And what does it say? It's they're, they're figuring out, hey, this guy's authority and he has truth. We look at all these churches. Pastor Cobb talks about all the churches that have been around here in Springcrest area for the last 50 years. If the world came in, if Joe Olstein came into this, this church right now, Joe Falstein, he'd say that this is a failing church because we don't have huge numbers. We don't have a nice building. But for me, this is a testament that this church is standing here when all these Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches and Methodist churches have come and gone in the last 50, 60 years. We're still here. But we're not here because Pastor Cobb's a great preacher, which he is. But that's not the reason. We're not here because, you know, I'm preaching such a great work. We're here because we stand on the rock. Because we're founded on a strong foundation, and that's what we're focused on. You know, if you, it, but there's no shortcut. Look, if you build something on a strong foundation, it's not easy work. It's not. I know Trey works on stuff all the time. If you have to... If you, if you give him the choice of drilling into concrete or sand, you know, he'd probably want to drill into sand. But he knows the concrete's going to last longer, right? My, my father-in-law, and, and I'll close with this, he knows about a, a strong foundation. They had to come and, uh, I guess, reestablish you know, the foundation on your house, and they, they, they installed the piers. And they like came back, and he's an engineer, and the engineers came, and they're like, you only need X amount of, of piers to you know, level the house back out again. And he basically like tripled the amount because he just wanted to make sure that thing would. My, my father-in-law's house in Garland, Texas, will be the last house standing before all the other houses because he, he put on a firm foundation. And that's what I wanted for Springcrest. That's what I want for us. We want to be the last stand. You know, before the wrath of God is poured upon this, you know, before we're raptured out, and we're, we've gone through the tribulation and we've endured Hey, let it be that fire's all around us, and there's war, and pestilence, and fear, but Springcrest is still around. I don't know what it'll look like, 
I don't know what it might be, but let us stand on the word of God. Let's not look for the shortcuts of life. The only way is Jesus Christ. You know, don't water down the message. Don't focus on your works. And don't associate with iniquity. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for, uh, again, the opportunity to preach this morning. Lord, be with Pastor Cobb. Uh, help him just get that blood pressure in order and that vertigo so uh, we can get him behind the pulpit again and that he can thunder your, thr your truth uh, to all of us. But in the meantime, just I appreciate the opportunity to be able to bring a message and to bring your truth. And Lord, uh, just be with all those here today and thank you for uh, your word that it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And no matter what the world does, no matter what they move, just help us to just be a strong foundation founded on that rock, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.